All right, Grace. Well, welcome to the podcast. All right. Thank you for having me. No, it's a pleasure. I'm really looking forward to supporting you. So the first question I have for you um, is, do you have an intention for this coaching conversation, meaning how do you want to walk away feeling? What do you want to understand about yourself so I can serve you in the best way possible? I think just how to deal with the eating disorder on top of the grief, which just makes me feel like I'm not good enough sometimes and better ways to deal with that would be helpful. Yeah. So just to give a bit of backstory, because this is going to be a podcast, do you mind just sharing um, is in as much detail or as little detail as you like about your current circumstance, what's happened recently and what you're currently struggling with? And then we'll go into the coaching. Yeah, of course. Um my dad was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer like late May 2020 um, and he was battling it for two years um, in, at the beginning of 2022 was uh, when it was kind of deteriorating and I think that was when I started having problems with food and I got diagnosed with anorexia I think in the middle of my GCSEs which is around this time now and um, I started recovery when I got diagnosed and but it was like up and down but then the day after my prom was when my dad went into hospital and uh, they just said that there was nothing more they could do to help him and so he was in hospital for I think a week before he went into Thames Hospice which is and then a week later he passed away in that um and like when he passed away I was determined that I was going to keep on recovering for him but then when I started college was when like I had a big relapse and was restricting quite a bit and I ended up in hospital but um it's been six or seven months since then and it's been up and down in recovery but I'm just trying to weight restore at the moment that's where I am good well thank you so much for sharing that that's a lot to go through and it's in such a short space of time as well mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Are you familiar with the stages of grief? I, there's a psychologist, and apologies that I don't know the name, but um, she's quite famous for for talking about the stages of grief. Are you aware of aware of that? Um, briefly, I think. Like I know that there's anger and like disbelief, but not totally. Where would you say that you are right now? If you had to choose, like, how do you feel about your dad's death? quite numb uh, sometimes at the beginning there was very much anger towards everyone like my friends for still having their dads mm -hmm. even my granddad sometimes for being alive at the age they were but now I would say it's kind of like realization of the situation I'm in yeah would you say you've reached acceptance of what's happened I think so because what like also acceptance with the eating disorder and the eating disorder would try to numb that feeling and make me focus on my body and food rather than the death of dad. Yeah, that's what I want to dive into if you're comfortable with that, Grace, is yeah, my question to you is what does the eating disorder bring you? So if you were to write like a column on a piece of paper with the title benefits of having an eating disorder because there are benefits because that's why you're in it because as humans there's always a benefit for what we do even when we say we don't want to do the thing so what mm -hmm. benefits do you get out of and I know you're in recovery but at the minute what benefits do you get from the eating disorder a sense of control even though I know you're you're not in control the eating disorder is mm -hmm. um and I think also like kind of being in a state where all you're focusing on is your body and food it kind of makes the world around you more blurry and 
like sometimes I miss that and I miss the comfort of not having these external problems I think so control and would you say distraction from life yeah yeah benefits so let's dive into control first of all so you are already very aware and and because of what you said in terms of you're not actually in control the eating disorder has been or is in control how do you feel on a scale of one to ten with ten being fully in control when you listen to the eating disorder rules in your head and don't forget Mm -hmm. I've been everyone's different but I've been in anorexia myself so I remember it like it was yesterday with what thoughts was going around in my head on a scale of one to ten how control in control do you feel when those voices are talking to you I'd say probably seven seven. yeah and what made you say seven so can you expand on why that feels quite controlling for you in a safe way because control is for humans can being in control it equals safety for us Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think because, like, when I would think about it, it would be like, so I'm the only one that can eat this food, so if I don't want to, then I won't. And I think having that decision, like, made me feel in control in a way. But then uh, the eating disorder would take it too far, and that's where it went out of control. Yeah. So it is a way of coping, isn't it? And I remember, and I don't know if it's the same for you, life is happening, especially what you've experienced. And whatever you do, there's nothing you could have done to control or change that situation with your Mm -hmm. dad. But what you could control is what you put in your mouth. Yeah, yeah. And So it does feel kind of safe in a way because it grounds you to to life in in a way it feels like you're doing something that feels safe Mm -hmm. yeah and so tell me how on a scale of one to ten let's ask a different question then when you say the eating disorder takes it too far how in control do you feel then with ten being fully in control probably three so it's interesting to me math isn't my strong point but you chose seven so then that's to ten seven eight nine ten it's three left to get to ten and then you chose three on the other end so they kind of balance each other out right can you see that yeah yeah Yeah. so there's not one that's stronger than the other if we're looking at the opposites they're kind of both equal I think so yeah and so let's go into, and there's a reason I'm kind of just asking random questions and going here and then I'm going to bring it together during the coaching. Let's go into the second part of the benefit you have for being in the eating disorder, and that's to distract yourself from life. Tell me about life. Let's pretend that you didn't have the eating disorder as distraction. Let's pretend you were unable to be in an eating disorder. Mm-hmm. How is that going to be for you when life happens? Well, I'm 17 now, so I think I'd be starting driving, doing my A-levels and kind of just starting my life. But because of the eating disorder, I'm only doing one A-level, not doing exams for that. And I don't know if I'm ready to start driving yet, but I think all of this stuff that seems quite scary to me now would be happening. Yeah, that's interesting because my next question, Grace, was going to be, what's scary about life? I mean, of of course, the obvious what's happened with your dad, that's what started this all off in the first place. But now, if you weren't to have your coping mechanism of restriction, what would be really scary about life? I think just growing older I've never really wanted to become a teenager or get older and now even more so with my dad I don't want to live more years that he's not in it yeah that's a lot and I've not lost a parent so I don't know how that feels I've lost grandparents but I, I understand that's not the same at all but give me the give me two choices that you have. So 
let's meet you where you're at currently. So you've experienced this loss of your dad, which is huge. Mm -hmm. You've not processed it fully yet. It's, you know, it's going to come up. There's, there's something at my granddad's funeral, the priest said, and this really resonated and just really stuck with me. And she said, grief never leaves you, but it changes. Yeah. So you will change, you will experience a different relationship to the grief that you currently feel as your life goes on. So let's meet yourself with where you're at. Give me the two choices that you have going forward in your life right now. Probably either listen to the eating disorder, which would either keep me where I am now or end me back in hospital and just not that great of a life or keep on recovering and start living life basically which scares you the most I think they both equally scare me because there's the rational side of me which is like you can't stay in this mental illness forever but then there's the eating disorder that's like but you, I don't want you to gain weight or anything like that. Which is stronger? Mm, at the moment, I think it's the eating disorder, but because of my mum and all of my friends, I would say they're the things that are encouraging me to keep on going at the moment. And what do you think your dad would have wanted? Me to keep on going. Yeah. Are you aware of the genetic component of anorexia? Yes, I am. Okay, good. Because that I, I wasn't when I was in recovery, mm -hmm. but now I am. And it, it looking back, it made so much sense to me. So when your weight restored, or at least on your way to, it's so much easier to continue recovery. So I'm not sure where you're at in terms of your weight restoration. Are you experiencing extreme hunger? At all, mm, I don't think I really am. I, there's mental hunger, but it's not massive. Okay, so when you go, if you keep continuing, or should I say, when you keep continuing with recovery, the more you eat and the more like weight you put on, which I know sounds like the worst thing in the world for me to say out loud right now because I've been there. I'd rather if someone killed me or something than we put weight mm. on. When that happens it will be easier to eat because your biology will be on board with recovery. Because at the minute, it sounds like you're still in the migration response. Do you know what the migration response is? It's it when, like, if you go back in time, it's when uh, people would just keep on moving to avoid famine. Absolutely. So that's from, it's not originally from Tabitha Farrar, but I've, I've learned that from Tabitha. Are you aware of Tabitha Farrar? Yes. Yes, great. So exactly. So at the minute, it sounds like your biology is on the lookout for a land where there's an abundant amount of food. So you need to eat less and move more to get to this place, which is why it's so almost impossible, but it's not impossible. It can feel impossible to eat and to rest. Mm -hmm. but I promise you, it's not always like that. There becomes like this invisible line, if you like, that when your weight kind of crosses over that, your biology is like, okay, cool. We've arrived at this place. Now I'm going to send out all this hunger signals to eat, eat, eat and eat, which again is, again, really scary. But that's the path to recovery. But then it becomes a lot easier because you just have to surrender to what your body wants. But now you're having to almost... I'm going to use the word fight, but I want to go into why I don't like using that, but it's just come to me. At the minute, you're having to just keep fighting forward to recovery. Right. Does it feel like you're fighting with the eating disorder when it comes to eating? Yes. Yeah. So I want to offer you something different. And I know I automatically said fight, but actually the way I coach my clients in anorexia recovery, especially, well, in any any kind of recovery, have you ever heard of the quote before, whatever we resist persists? No, I've never heard that. No. So if you're another way to describe this, this is the way that Tabitha uses, actually, if you imagine your inbox and you've got spam coming in so let's say the spam is eating disorder thoughts the rules 
you know how that feels and what that's yeah. like. That's spam coming into your inbox. Now, if you click on the spam, because let's say the title of the spam is, oh, you've won 5,000 pounds. And you're like, oh, maybe. So you click on it, you open it, you've opened the spam, you're reading it, it's taking your time, your attention, you're tempted to like click on it, maybe not. It's a lot harder to just delete that spam. Now you've opened it up. Mm -hmm. That would be fighting with it. That would be interacting with the spam aka the eating disorder thoughts but if you practice when an eating disorder thought comes in see it as like your spam coming into your inbox instead of opening it no matter what the tempting title is telling you straight into delete or into a different just like move it straight away out of your inbox so you're not opening it you're not talking to it you're not giving it any attention you're just dismissing it Mm -hmm. and then you place your attention somewhere else this takes practice but I want to give you a tangible example has your mum or your dad when he was alive doesn't matter what age you were if, if you just remember something like this where you've really really desperately wanted to do something or have something as a child and either mum or dad have said no because I said so it's just it's a complete no yeah so can you connect to the feeling where no matter how much you want to, mum or dad have said, no, that's the end of it. And you've just been like, oh, fine. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's good. They just dismissed you probably for your, the greater good, probably like good parenting. I'm sure. Right. It's not a bad thing. I want you to, this is where the, the challenge comes to parent yourself against the eating disorder so if you see the eating disorder as I mean not as evil because it was there originally to actually try and protect you mm -hmm. help you cope right it's no longer serving you because that path of the eating disorder is going to lead to death yourself and you don't want that yeah so if you practice dismissing it junk mail without even opening it it becomes a lot easier and you're not fighting with the thought because when you fight with the thought, it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it does, really. Yeah, so just practice that from this moment on. It will take practice, but it does get easier. The second you're sitting down to eat, and I remember it so well, the, all the anxiety and the fear and like everything inside of you is screaming at you to run and you hate anyone who's bringing you food. You just want them to go away and leave you alone. Mm -hmm. Notice what's going on. Give yourself some love. If it's helpful, imagine your dad giving you just a big hug. Yeah. In that moment. And I feel emotional right now. <sighs> imagine him giving you a big hug and then choose to dismiss the eating disorder thoughts and focus on recovery thoughts or recovery actions or a dog or a flower, just wherever you your attention is, that's where you are. Mm -hmm. That's a good way to think about it. Yeah, so try that for sure. Mm -hmm. Let me just think where I want to go next. With the, with the wanting to recover, because obviously you know in order to recover, you you have to want to recover, right? That's kind of obvious. Yeah. What I'm hearing is it's kind of 50-50 for you with the driver of wanting to stay in the ED and the driver of wanting to take the recovery road. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you sat with yourself and, and I encourage you to write this down, actually. In fact, there's a worksheet I'm going to send you after this session that I want you to fill in and, and send back to me. Okay. It's really beneficial to do this, but I'm going to ask it you in the question form. If you were to fast forward two years from now and you chose the eating disorder every day, because we are a product of our choices, and all the little things add up to the big thing. You don't just all of a sudden have an eating disorder, right? You start restricting and you start restricting more and then you start X. So it's all the little things and all of a sudden you have this end result. Yeah. Recovery, you don't eat a slice of pizza and all of a sudden you're recovered. It's facing that anxiety and that fear, self-compassion, dad's giving me a hug, 
dismiss the eating disorder thought, do the opposite of what it's asking you to do over time. And then you you're in recovery, like you're recovered. And so if in two years time you chose the eating disorder every day, where would, where would you be? What would your life look like in two years? Pretty miserable. I think, I think, because I could see how much it was hurting my mum as well. I think our relationship would be almost ruined. And I think I'd be quite lonely and just with only the eating disorder. What about five years? So then, what, five years time you'll be how old? 23? 22? to my maths is not my strong point 22 23 <laughs> let's go with that yeah. imagine you were in the eating disorder for five years if you still survived how would your life look then I think it wouldn't really be a life it would just be breathing mm. yeah right and so now let's go the positive route which you always have a choice right so I remember in recovery, I didn't want to get better. I was kind of blackmailed in a good way. Now, looking back in hindsight, I was kind of blackmailed into getting better. And I'm so glad I did because obviously where I am now, but I didn't really want to recover. It was like I was being forced to. I don't work with my clients that way because I want to show you that you have the power to choose and you have the responsibility in a from a loving place that you get to choose recovery no one can do it for you no one's forcing you to do it of course people want you to your loved ones especially but you get to choose yeah so tell me how your life might be like in two years when you choose the recovered path which isn't going to be easy I'm not going to pretend it's easy you're right you know that what would it look like do you think your life I'd hope to start working and meeting new people, just keeping dad's memory alive. What about five years? (laughs) Well, I don't know what I want to do as a job yet, but I have thought that I want to do a lot of charity raising for the hospice my dad was in and then pancreatic cancer so it would be nice to just see myself doing that that's beautiful I'm going to ask you to jump forward 10 years if you can Mm -hmm. because we have an option for 10 years in the recovered path right the other path you won't be here this path you get to be here so let's say you're 27 Mm mm-hmm let where so you've done what you like you're really involved in charity work you're keeping your dad's memory alive what else do you think you could be doing and how you'd be living when you're 27 maybe married <laughs> I don't know or be or just I'd hope to be an um, inspiration to other people for sure yeah. I mean I always encourage people that are really serious about recovery to think about in the future becoming a recovery coach Mm -hmm. like myself right because it's so fulfilling to help women every day recover from I work with different types of eating disorders anorexia bulimia binge eating to recover and to just get their life back it's so rewarding yeah so that's open to you as well and you get to work for yourself also that way Yeah, I think helping people would be good. And I feel like I can talk to people quite easily. So, Yeah. And, you know, so what I see, and I don't know if you've connected this already, probably you have because you're a smart girl, but I really want to hone in on you so you can see every single choice you make in the moment in terms of food and recovery, you're not just choosing quote recovery for example eating the pizza what you're really choosing is helping is creating um, a charity around what your dad struggled with you're creating an opportunity to help others as you become a coach so it 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 doesn't become about the pizza 
it becomes about other people that you get to help and support and make a big difference with. Yeah. Yeah. So I want you to link that, Grace, to every food choice you make, pro-recovery food choice. You're not choosing that little choice in the moment. You're choosing life and helping people and making the world a better place. Yeah, I will. Thank you. That will help in empower you until you reach that line like I said with the weight restoration and then everything becomes so much easier physically because you want to eat it's natural you you are pulled to eat and then you work on a lot of body image work and self-regulation so what support are you getting currently with your recovery I um I'm under CAMS which is the NHS the yeah. yeah and I've got a social worker through the hospice which who actually knew my dad and I'm very close to all of them I think that's wonderful so yeah. you are that's important that you are getting support and you're not doing this alone no I'm very thankful for the support I have and I think if I didn't have it I wouldn't know what to do with myself yeah do you mind sharing what's the best parts about them supporting you in your recovery that you've experienced like what's really helpful because it might help others as well listening you see yeah I think probably finally finding your voice um because they encourage you to do so and I think genuinely becoming not friends with them but you do create quite a close bond and you realize like oh I I am a person that's can do all of this stuff and meet people so I'd say that it's beautiful and you mentioned something at the beginning um when we first started this conversation you said you don't feel good enough when you choose the ED is that is that what you meant when you said you don't feel good enough can you expand on that a little bit I think some I get quite upset about not being a teenager like I'm in this I've got this awful mental illness and a group of a dad but then when I actually am being a teenager and I'm laughing with my friends and that I feel quite guilty like I, I shouldn't be but I think that's got to do with the eating disorder and the grief altogether. It has. And I would like to dive into that. So guilt is an emotion that comes when we feel like we've done something wrong. So what is it that you feel that you've done wrong when you're having a good time? I think like, oh, I, am I actually struggling? I should be struggling right now. Or um, like, I don't deserve to be laughing like this. Why do you think it's bad to not struggle? Finish yeah. this sentence. Mm -hmm. I need to struggle because... The eating disorder finds comfort in it. And this means... I miss out on life. Right, so the struggle that the eating disorder wants you to have is keeping you from missing out on life. So it's not you that's feeling guilty. It's the eating disorder that's sending guilty feelings to try and get you to stay with what the eating disorder wants. Yeah. So in that moment, when you feel guilty for having a good time with your friends, what are you doing? Are you doing anything actively when you feel that guilt? sometimes I go a bit quiet or I just continue talking to them yeah okay, so I want to give you some practical things that you can do in the moments when and this is very common and it is connect it is connected to the eating disorder but it's also connected to low self-worth mm -hmm. which can or cannot have anything to do with the eating disorder but it's a pattern that I see a lot of and I had very low self-worth as well and my comfort zone was also struggle up until six years ago 
I needed to feel like I was working really hard or struggling at something until my sister said to me one day, and this is just such a simple question, but it really stuck with me. She said, Vic, why do you always have to make things hard for yourself? And then I was like, oh shit, I literally choose to make things difficult for myself. Why is that? And so I started journaling about it and I was like, okay, I need to find struggle in life because that means then that I'm strong and I'm capable and I'm safe. And then, then people can see how strong I am. And so it was all about feeling safety from others. But I created that, eating disorder kind of created that a long time ago, that I need to be struggling in order to be safe. Yeah. That's not true. Does that resonate with you, that kind of connection? Yeah, I think so. Because when my dad was first diagnosed, everyone would say to me, like, oh, you seem to be so strong. Like, yeah. you seem like a very strong person. But then, like, at first I was crying every day and dad just said to me, you know, you can't do this. Life's got to keep on going on. And then obviously now with the eating disorder, it's just... I think sometimes it's about communication, showing people like, like I am struggling, look at me, um, but I'm still going. Yeah. If you could have a fairy godmother come with a magic wand today and take away all your struggle, why would you not want her to do that? Why would you still want to struggle? I think in ways it's made me more mature. Like um, I've had experiences that not a lot of people my age have had. Yeah. yeah. So it makes you more mature. And what does that mean? So what benefit do you think you get from being mature and resilient and having experiences that others haven't? Um, maybe that I can more easily talk to adults or people older, but it still doesn't make me, like when people say, oh, you're so mature, I, it still doesn't make me feel good. Yeah. So in the moment when you're feeling guilty and you're not feeling enough, I want you to start doing something instead of just allowing it to be there or perhaps fighting it or perhaps stopping yourself from living and what I want you to do it's all in your mind so no one will know that it's happening but the first thing I want you to do is notice that it's happening because we can't change anything if we're not aware of what's going on would you say that you're quite aware of when the guilt and the shame is happening within you yeah, I think more so now than I was a few months ago. Okay, great. So when you're aware of the guilty feeling, I want you to just stop for a few moments, like either physically stop or just in your mind, just stop and notice. And then give yourself compassion and love. Always step number one is just to acknowledge yourself, meet yourself where you're at. Like I said before, imagine your dad giving you a big hug and just meeting yourself there. And then you get to choose differently. So you don't have to continue feeling the guilt. It might take a bit longer when you first practice this, but over time it gets easier. What is What could you say to yourself? Because your thoughts are very powerful and that, that your thoughts create your feelings and then create your vibration and then create your life. What could you say to yourself that you believe to help you to stop feeling guilty? that dad would want me to be laughing like this and that's true how true is that for you out of 10 with 10 being that's true Ten. and if you connect to his voice saying that to you like at some, I mean whatever you know him whatever the, how he ever would say it to you like I it's nice to see you having fun or whatever how does that make you feel inside when you connect to him saying that to you proud of myself I think because so I just remember talking to him in the hospice a lot and it was like just a random thing like oh 
dad do you want me to still continue with archery because that was like our sport to do together and he said it's it's your decision but I would really like you to just continue all of those things that you would do just as I was there it's beautiful and so if you could describe that feeling in three words so you've already said proud of yourself what are the two feeling words do you feel when you imagine him saying to you something like I'm so proud of you for having fun and smiling with your friends what else do you feel warm warm Mm -hmm. and be thankful just that because someone once said to me that um I wish I had a dad like yours and so even though I only had him for 16 years I'm just thankful to have had someone like him in my life it's beautiful and now connect to so the same scenario you're having fun with your friends the guilt hits you from the ED how does that feel if you're if you were to listen to the e, the thoughts of the ED you're not good enough you shouldn't be having fun you should be struggling how does that feel in three feeling words if you were to listen to that um wrong mm-hmm. um, maybe upset and just angry yeah which one's true so you've got this the choice to speak to yourself kindly the way your dad would speak to you and you've got the choice to listen to the thoughts of the ed you know how different they feel which one is true do you think dad and how do you know that cuz they're positive thoughts and like dad's always right that's what he used to say <laughs> there you go <laughs> and so is that helpful to just really be clear in the moment so this is with anything so any thing that Eton is sort of throws at you to try and make you stay with that in that prison awareness love and compassion imagine your dad giving you a hug and then hear his voice say something kind to you feel that and then take that action yeah the more you do that your brain is always watching you right so your brain hasn't got eyes you have eyes like you as grace have has eyes your brain is an organ like your kidney, right? And so what your brain, how it works is it gives you automatic thoughts if you've been thinking them for quite a while because it habituates everything because that's what the brain does because when you learn to drive, you'll realize that when you first learn to drive, oh my God, for me, it was horrific and I never wanted to sit in a car again. And now I drive without even thinking about it and I'm there before I even know how I've got there because it habituates everything you learn so you don't have to think about it. So at the minute, the eating disorder thoughts, because you've been in the eating disorder, not for too long, by the way, which is really good news because it's easier to get out and you will get out, no doubt about that. But those thoughts, because they've been there for, what, a year and a half? Yeah. About a year and a half. Your brain has been watching you for that year and a half, and it's noticing, okay, Grace is acting like she's scared of food. Grace is acting like she's scared of weight gain. So therefore, we're going to send her thoughts and feelings to ensure that she still continues to be scared of weight gain and to be scared of food and to move a lot, because that's what she keeps choosing to act as and so over time when you're consistent with repetition you aware like I said awareness self-love and compassion dad gives you a hug he says something kind to you you act on that your brain will watch that and it will be like oh and this doesn't take that long it takes I mean everyone's different but around 10 consistent repetitions of acting in that way and already your brain starts to be like oh Well, she's not acting like she's afraid of weight gain or food anymore. So therefore, we're just going to hang fire and just like watch her for a bit longer. And if she still continues to act like she's not afraid, then we'll stop giving her the old thoughts and feelings that make her afraid because she obviously doesn't want that anymore. Yeah, that's true. Right. And I'm going to show you now in real time 
how powerful you are, how you get to choose recovery every day. So I want you to close your eyes and I'll do it with you so you don't feel weird. <laughs> Let me know when your eyes are closed because I can't see. They're closed. Okay, I want you to imagine in your mind's eye, in your vision, that there's another version of you sat in front of you and let me know when you can see her I can see her okay great now I want you to hear that version of you say your own name out loud three times and let me know when you've heard her say that I've heard it okay open your eyes right what part of your brain was that because it wasn't a memory it wasn't something that you've remembered from the past you've just created that so tell me how you did that with my imagination right and your imagination is your mind not your brain yeah where do you think your mind is oh I've got no idea thank you at the front of my brain or around it. So your mind is every cell of your body mm -hmm. and your brain is in your physical skull. Right. Right. So you, the conscious part of you, which is your mind, gets to choose what you want in life. Your brain, like I said, is an organ. It habituates everything. It gives you eating disorder thoughts and it continues on what you teach it. And this would have you know, from the second you're born, your brain's constantly learning. And it just like, people think that we're our brains and we're not. We are our mind. Now, here's the thing though, your brain and your unconscious brain and everything that's like wired into that, it drives 95% of your behavior and your thoughts and your feelings and actions every single day. It's mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. But there's 5% of you, which is what you've just experienced, like your imagination, your consciousness, your mind, you get to then choose and you can physically choose with your mind and rewire your brain to give you the thoughts, the feelings and the life that you want. I know this sounds a bit far-fetched, but am I making sense? Yeah, you are. Okay, because there's been, and this is going in a bit of a different direction. I don't know how you feel about spirituality. How how do you feel about something else being out there? Well, I'm not religious, but like I've never really delved into spiritual stuff. Is the book, have you got a pen and paper near you or can you write something down? Yes, I do. There's a book that I invite you to read. Mm -hmm or to listen to, because it's on Audible, depending on how you like to read or listen to your books. And it's called We Don't Die. And the author is Sandra Champlain. So it's C-H-A-M-P-L-A-I-N. Thank you. No, you're welcome. I think that will be really beneficial for you to read because... It's very down to earth. It's not like all woo woo. I mean, I am woo woo, but I understand not, not everyone is. Mm -hmm. She actually wrote that book because she was a skeptic. She didn't believe in anything and she needed proof that there was something else out there. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm talking about this, Grace, is because consciousness, the, your mind, your imagination, that's who we really are. And you're, and, this I still feel like I want to share this because it's true for me your dad is still alive just not in a human body yeah how true does that feel to you I have heard it from other pupils as well and so I do sometimes feel him around yes and so if you if you feel called to and I invite you to do this and I want you to share with me I want you in your own time today at some point just sit with yourself and close your eyes and connect to the energy of your dad because he's absolutely there. And I want you to ask him for a sign. And when you do this, something random will come to your mind. So let me give you an example of, this is exactly what I shared with one of my clients when we first started coaching because she lost her dad too. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and she didn't really believe in anything and she was really confused about it all and she had a lot of like un unresolved things that had happened with her dad and she didn't do this on the call because you need to just do it by yourself and just see what comes to you and she said okay so I did it after the call and she sat that day and she just closed her eyes and she just said okay dad if you're there give me an image of what I'm gonna see in the next day or two that will show me that you are here and she had an image of a blue ball and she thought okay, whatever, Victoria just said something would come, that's random, I'll just let it go. And she got on with her life. Two days later, she's on the beach with a dog. She hasn't got blue balls for her dogs. So she was chucking the balls, um, her red balls for her dogs. And then one of her dogs came back with a blue ball randomly from somewhere on the beach. And then Julia, my client, just sat down and just cried happy tears because that was confirmation that her dad was there and of course he's there wow <laughs> wow so I want you to do that don't be afraid of not getting the answer don't be afraid of not seeing it just sit with yourself ask your dad for a sign he will give you an image and then let it go and just live your life and you will see the sign yeah okay I can do that see how that feels and then that will just give you an extra sense of like oh he is here I can't speak to him physically like a, I would if he was in his human body but he's still here with me and he's going to be supporting you every single step to recovery yeah yeah okay there's one thing I want to share with you before we wrap up and that is and I know I've kind of gave you quite a lot of homework so far and I will send you the recording so you can watch this back as well have you ever taken time to sit down and write out the food freedom and body love version of grace the recovered version of grace mm -hmm. I haven't done that no okay so this is going to be really powerful and by the way I'm holding a um before every coaching call I have I've got crystals on my um desk and I just feel called to hold a crystal and the crystal I've chose for you, this is um, a self-love crystal. It's called Rose Quartz. And my friend actually had it engraved in my spirit animal, which is a bird. I mean, there's no coincidence that this is spirit animal. And I chose this to hold amongst my other ones that aren't in a spirit animal. Right. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. It's really cool. And so I want you to write. So pen and paper not on the laptop if you can it really works better with pen and paper mm -hmm. at the top write down my recovered the recovered version of me or whatever resonates with you the, the recovered me okay so yeah so actually do it do this part now and then I'll leave you to it for the homework but so start off by writing the recovered me and then underline that yeah and then on the next line, because this is really important, I want you to write, I am remembering the future. And this is what happens, dot, dot, dot. Okay. And so what I want you to do in your own time is set up a sacred space for yourself to do this. So maybe light a candle, put some soft music on, like whatever you need to do to feel like comfy and safe and cozy. I want you to write down and ask your dad to join you on this because he will and you'll feel that. Write down who you are when you're recovered in the present tense though so let's say you're looking two to five years ahead but it won't it won't doesn't mean you have to wait two to five years to be this person this version of you write down who you are in the present tense so I wake up every morning and I feel this way I eat delicious like so write down as if you're doing it now and then all you're doing is remembering the future and then when you have that vision, I want you to read it every day and you will automatically, because here's another thing about the way the mind works and the way the brain works, because the mind is the consciousness, the brain works with that to make your humanness and all of that. 
So when you focus on something, the 5% of you that is conscious, that gets to choose, when you focus and read this vision and feel it every day that you're going to write out, your unconscious mind, part of the brain, goes about finding people, places, things, experiences to make that real for you. As an example, have you ever moved house in your life? No, I haven't. Have you ever, well, not you yourself, but have your parents got a new car before? Yes. How old were you roughly when they got a new car? Uh, my mum got a new car two years ago. Okay. So do you mind, there's a reason I'm asking this. Do you mind sharing what colour the car is? Silver. And what make, do you know what make it is? Ford. Right, so did you or did you not notice when you were just about to get the new car or when you just got the new car, loads of silver Fords everywhere? Yeah. Why do you think that is? Because now you've got a silver Ford, you just see it everywhere and it's in your mind. You're focused on that. And so doesn't mean everyone else has gone out and randomly bought a silver Ford. Because you're focused on it in your environment, your unconscious mind is like, oh, she's focusing on a silver Ford. So therefore, she obviously that's important to her. Let me show her silver Fords everywhere because that's what she wants to see. Mm -hmm. So we can use our unconscious mind to serve us. But it also it doesn't have any intention of helping you for better or for worse. It just follows the instructions from your conscious mind and the instructions are whatever you focus on you get more of so if you focus on the vision that you're going to write out and just connect to that every day if you focus on your dad's energy and him supporting you into recovery whatever you focus on you get more of so before you know it you will be recovering and recovered and you won't quite believe how far you've come right if you constantly open the spam mail, read the eating disorder bullshit thoughts and rules, try to fight it, whatever you focus on, you get more of. Even if you're trying to fight the eating disorder thoughts, they're just going to come even more and harder and heavier because you're focusing on them. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. And one last thing, because I think this is really going to help you. It's kind of cool as well. Another little closed eye exercise to show you how your unconscious mind works. Okay. Okay, so I want you to close your eyes. Yep. And I want you to imagine you've walked downstairs. We probably already downstairs. You, you're in your kitchen mm -hmm. and you get a lemon from the fridge or the fruit bowl or whatever. Just imagine there's a lemon in front of you in the kitchen on a chopping board. Okay. Can you see that? Yep. Right. I want you to get a small knife and cut the lemon in half. Yep. And I want you to see like the juice of the lemon dripping out a bit onto the chopping board, like the juice of the lemon's gone onto the knife a little bit. Mm -hmm. And you can start to smell the aroma of the lemon. Okay. And I want you to take half of the lemon and I want you to pick it up and put it to your face and smell the lemon and bring it towards your mouth as if you're going to take a bite of the lemon. Mm -hmm. Do you or do you not currently have saliva in your mouth? I do, yes. <laughs> right, open your eyes. Mm -hmm. Do you know that you weren't holding a lemon to your face? Your unconscious mind didn't know because your unconscious mind doesn't know the difference between reality and make-believe. So it even responded physically with the saliva in your mouth as if you were, and it, I did, and I was the one creating the vision for you. Mm -hmm. So your body and your physical environment responds to what you imagine in your mind because that is how freaking powerful your mind is. Yeah, wow. Well. So you get to create, you are the creator of your life and you get to create from that 5% of you that is consciousness and that gets to choose. And you just need to train your brain how you want it to act every day. Currently it's acting like an eating disorder brain. Mm -hmm. We don't want that anymore. You get to change that. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's not going to feel 
when I say it's not going to feel nice, it will, it will feel better and better and better within days, the more you keep doing what I've showed and spoke about today, but it's going to feel uncomfortable because your brain doesn't want to change until it realizes, oh, okay, yeah, she's pretty serious about the change. So we'll change the, the synapses of the way it fires and then we'll create this thought for her instead. Right, yeah. So I know I kind of went random different ways in this call, but how? what have you taken away from this, Grace, and how do you feel? I feel a lot better because just that my dad will be there with me throughout it all and... Like it's the recovery is worth it, I think. Do you think or you know? I know. It's so worth it. And like speaking from someone who has had anorexia, Grace, it is so fuck, excuse my language, so fucking worth it. Mm -hmm. uh, the life without, I mean, you've experienced that. Like you can remember a, the, your life before the eating disorder. Yeah. But the best thing about an eating disorder is when you come out the other side, you have such, you have so much more wisdom and depth to you as a person, mm -hmm. especially from what you've experienced with your dad as well. You, that will, that will always be part of you, but you get to use that trauma and use that pain as your stepping stones to help others. Mm -hmm. That's why it's happened yeah that's true yeah well thank you for for being here grace and thanks for being open to having it shared because this is going to help so many people as well i'm sure no thank you i'm really honored that you asked like for this and i'm thankful you're welcome so what i'm going to do is i'm going to send you that worksheet in fact i'm going to send you two there's a vision worksheet in which is a journaling exercise I've just recently spoke about. And there's the um, cost and gain, the five, the two year, five year and 10 year vision. So I think if you, if you focus on that and also the homework of asking your dad to show you a sign, I would love for you to update me on that, please. I will, yeah. And I'll update it with the podcast listeners on my next episode when you get your sign. So they, I'm sure they'll be wanting to hear as well. Okay. And if you need me, I'm I'm here for you. Thank you so much. All right, my love, you're welcome. Well, big love. To you too. Thank you, Grace. And and give your mum a hug from me. I know I know we don't know each other, but it's gonna be hard for her too. But she tell tell her from me, she probably watched this back anyway, mm -hmm. that you, so her little girl, will absolutely get there. I know it. <laughs> that she'll love that. Thank you. And if your mum wants to message me, she's more than welcome. I'm more than happy to speak to her about anything. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, you're welcome. All right, Grace. Well, enjoy your day. Much love. And I will let you know when I release this, but I'll send you the video before anyway, so you can watch it back. Okay. Really, thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, sweetheart. See you soon. Bye. Bye.